Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to Grand Rounds today. Uh, you know, this is the uh, season for reflection and giving thanks, and I wanted to take a moment before we started to uh, thank uh, Avela Bank, who has been very generous in their support of Grand Rounds and uh, other CME programming uh, here at Mary Greeley. Um, uh, and have, have been really instrumental in allowing us to continue to, to provide what I think is really good quality CME. Uh, today, uh, it is my pleasure to welcome back Dr. Jeff Wall. Uh, Dr. Wall received his Doctor of Pharmacy degree from Idaho State University. Um, he has had uh, academic appointments uh, at the University of Iowa, uh, Des Moines University, and uh, currently is a professor of uh, pharmacy practice at Drake. He also uh, is a, a clinical pharmacist in uh, internal medicine at our Methodist Medical Center and uh, has previously joined us and given us some really, really good uh, CME in regards to uh, game changers and pharmacotherapeutics. And uh, today he kindly has accepted our invitation to uh, provide us with a review of what's available in our armamentarian uh, for combating COVID. And uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Jeff Wall. Mm. All right, thank you very much. I hope uh, people online can hear me as well. Um, um, yeah, so uh, I'm, I'm honored as always to come here. I actually really like coming to, to Mary Greeley and, and doing kind of drug updates for you guys. We do something similar in our grand rounds uh, two or three times a year, which we call RUP, Rapid Update for Physicians. And uh, it's actually, you know, I, I do it with a couple of uh, the, the uh, residency program directors, and um, I'd like to think it's one of the more popular grand rounds we have. Certainly the, the attendings and, and the residents seem to really like it. So uh, today, Today we're going to do a update on therapeutic options and just kind of an overview of COVID. Um, as much as I'd like to say COVID has disappeared, I'm sure all of you know that that, that unfortunately isn't the case. But as we were talking before, I mean, I think the good news is that is that certainly I've seen the impact of vaccination in improving outcomes, and I think we probably all have. And I think the other thing we've we've seen uh, is is we have several drug options now that I think have really have really improved outcomes in patients at risk of, of deteriorating and, and requiring hospitalization. Of course, we're in the midst and uh, in demand and I'm sure this is true in Ames of 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 the you know the triple demic that they say and I mean uh, in our hospital you know I'd say we're as busy as we ever were at the depths of COVID I mean you know we still have 30 people boarding in the in the ER our, our pediatric emergency room is completely overwhelmed and and you know we're we're regularly seeing people in the in, you know just sitting in in, in the hallway and in, in the emergency department so we're still seeing a lot of sick patients but uh, the good news is I think a lot of people it certainly isn't as 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 uh, dire as it was a year ago this time when we literally saw, you know, you know, we had rows of patients on, on the vent who were just never going to get better. So today we're going to talk about uh, some of the key points about COVID-19 rebound. Uh, there is some new data looking at that, so we're going to talk about that as well. We're going to describe Paxlovid use, prescribing, and availability. Um, uh, even now, I, most of my uh, ambulances are probably prescribing it two or three times a day, so we'll talk a little bit about its use, and then just talk about some more COVID therapeutics and availability. Um, this, is, you know, this slide is already, I'm sure, out of date. Um, it seems like every a month we they, uh, the the CDC announces the development of a new uh, substrain of, of of Omicron, and uh, you know basically you know as it stands now, I, the kind of the, the current pattern is that the the new variant of Omicron comes out, it rapidly takes over as the primary variant in the United States as another wave of infections rolls over everybody, and then it kind of you know d decreases some, and then you see the next subvariant uh, come down the line and. Certainly, you know, I've seen, uh, in fact, our, in our, on my medicine service, we had our, our, um, um, in one of our interns actually had, to, had got diagnosed with COVID and actually had to take five days off. And uh, unfortunately, we then had to check everybody that he saw because he was, um, you know, seeing patients and wasn't wearing a mask when he went in there. And so we ended up having to check all these patients for COVID as well. He actually did pretty good. He bounced right back. Um, and I think that's what we're seeing a lot of is people are being reinfected. But the good news is that it seems that the, the newer um, uh, uh, lineages of Omicron seem to be, while probably more infectious, less virulent. They don't, they don't have the ability to kill people quite as well as other Omicron variants and certainly not Delta that we were all in the depths of last year. So, so you know, again, you know, deaths um, have, have, there's been some spikes and this, this only goes to June, but I think that the trajectory is probably fairly similar that, you know, when the, when the pandemic started, of course, we had a gigantic spike that came down over 20. And then of course we had the huge, huge spike during the winter of 20 to 21. And that was again, probably the worst I, I can ever remember being in the ICU. We had, you know, <clears throat> you know, rows of people on the vent. We had two 
or three people on ECMO. Almost none of them made it, um, and it was, it, you know, it was unfortunately kind of a death sentence at that point. Then, of course, the, you know, the vaccines came in, and we saw a big drop, and then we've seen a couple of other spikes a, 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 in, in 2022. But again, I think the trajectory has continued to go down, even as infections have gone up in these patients. So uh, something that's really been studied into the ground, I think, pretty well now is, is risk factors uh, for, or, for patients. And the only problem with a lot of the early studies was that, uh, you know, the uh, ri early risk factor studies did not look at vaccinated patients. And so um, uh, this paper uh, came out recently uh, from MMWR that took a look at patients who had been vaccinated and still had a severe outcome, which they uh, um, defined as hospitalization or death. And as you can see, things haven't changed a ton um, in, in patients who have been uh, um, uh, vaccinated with the primary series. But uh, some of the ones that, that really come to mind that haven't changed a lot are immunosuppression. And certainly the last two or three patients we've seen get really, really sick in our ICU with, with COVID, almost all of them were on immunosuppression for organ transplant, or they were cancer patients who were receiving, uh, you know, immunosuppressive uh, chemotherapy, stuff like that. Uh, um, uh, chronic pulmonary disease, and again, people with bad COPD, stuff like that. Chronic liver disease, chronic kidney disease, chronic neurologic diseases, and that was things like myasthenia and, and MS. And again, the, probably the reason for that is a lot of these patients are on immunosuppressive medications, diabetes, but notice that was something that was a clear risk factor uh, before uh, the, the availability of the vaccines, which is obesity, uh, actually has kind of slipped back into the into the below the one here. So it's, it, it wasn't a, they did not find a statistically significant uh, increase in, in bad outcomes outcomes, and of course, age, as we're all well aware. So, I mean, when you're taking a look at patients and you're seeing them in your clinic and you're wondering, you know, gee, you know, is this person a candidate for therapies for, for COVID-19 once they've been diagnosed? Uh, the answer is is yes, in particular, if they're elderly or if they're on immunosuppression. And I think, I think you know, there's some other risk factors, certainly, but I think those are the ones that we've seen in the last year or so who still get pretty sick with COVID and can have bad outcomes. So this is uh, um, the COVID-19 guidelines, uh, uh, basically from the CDC. Again, this this changes all the time. So you know, keep that in mind that you know th this could be outdated just in a couple of months. Um, I don't think that's going to be the case because if you look at the pipeline for medications with uh, uh, for COVID, uh, there don't, there doesn't seem to be anything really big on the horizon likely to come in the next six months. But again, you never know. Uh, so uh, basically, the patient disposition is is the first question you have to ask. And so if someone has COVID and they do not require Hospital, hospitalization or supplemental oxygen uh, if they're at high risk. So basically the patients that, that were, you know, basically in this list here, so immunosuppression, pulmonary disease, liver disease, over age 65, uh, the preferred therapies in order of preference is a ratonavir-based uh, nertralavir, which I'm just going to call Paxlovid from now on. I know we're not supposed to use name brands, but it's just far easier to say Paxlovid. And then remdesivir, which uh, should be given as an outpatient because it can only be given IV, so it needs to be given as an, usually in an outpatient infusion center for three days. Uh, and then alternative of therapies, uh, uh, basically when nothing else is feasible. And unfortunately, uh, betzilobobamab is now actually not recommended anymore. As you can see, it's a C3 even here. But now the CDC is saying that basically the newer variants of Omicron are not, that it's not effective against it. So they're basically saying not to use it anymore. And the mol molupralavir, which is the Merck drug uh, for it, which unfortunately seems to be far less effective than uh, Paxlovid is, is, is again, only when, when you can't use anything else. In patients who don't require oxygen, you do do not need to use steroids or anything else um, unless they need to be on steroids for some other reason. So most of the patients you're going to see in an outpatient setting, at most, you're probably going to be offering them Paxlovid if they're at high risk. Um, now, um, uh, um, uh, we know that Paxlovid, uh, you know, is associated uh, with, with improved outcomes. This is data from the big New England Journal of Medicine study that came out uh, uh, late last year that looked at COVID-related hospitalization or death in or any cause. And so these are patients who got five days worth of of, of Paxlovid versus placebo and patient again patients with COVID-19 at high risk for regression and as you can see by this Kaplan-Meier curve the numbers overall are fairly small um, the, the overall difference was only about six percent but again that was statistically significant um, and um, it it, it uh, did have an, an improvement in outcomes number needed to treat if I remember right was about 55 which actually isn't that bad considering uh, uh, the, the numbers that we have and how relatively safe Paxlovid seems to be. The big problem that my clinicians 
call me all the time with is drug drug interactions because unfortunately this uh, uh, Paxlovid has has a ritonavir booster in it. So basically, we use ritonavir to significantly increase the the levels of of naltrimavir um, uh, the, and the re, uh, because by itself the drug levels of, of of that of that medication are very low in patients, and so we have to do something to block the metabolism of that drug so the, the drug levels increase, and so that's what we use ritonavir for for more more veteran clinicians in the audience, you might remember that. So that was our primary strategy in the early aughts when we were treating uh, HIV. M many of the regimens that we used to use for HIV actually had ritonavir boosting in it, and now we don't need to do that anymore with the better drugs we have. But that's that's basically the big problem is, is drug interactions. And I, I get a call at least twice a week now about, hey, you know, is, you know can I use this medication in somebody? Um, the, I, you know, I certainly am happy to help my physicians uh, when, I, when they ask me this question, but actually they can kind of bypass me and go right to the, the University of Liverpool COVID-19 drug interaction page, which is pretty much the one-stop shop that you have to look for for drug interactions and, and Paxlovid. Um, so this is basically what I use, and I even tell them that's like, yeah, I'm happy to help you, but you don't need to you don't need to come to me. You can actually just look up in the University of, of, of Liverpool guidelines yourself or the interaction checker. Um, some of the more, and what I like about this is that you know there's other drug interaction checkers certainly out there, but they just basically say, yes, you can use it. No, you can't. And unfortunately, I think that ties my clinician's hands quite a bit because it's like, well, you know, I'd like to use Paxlovid in these patients, but this, you know, I, they're on X medication and this website says I can't use it. So now what am I supposed to do? And I think one of the things that the Liverpool uh, Drug Interaction Checker does is it actually gives you the literature behind the recommendation. So you can actually make your own call whether the benefit of being on Paxlovid outweighs the risks. And so I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, as you might imagine, many of these patients over age 65, many of them have hyperlipidemia, so many of them are on statins. And yes, if I punch in uh, a torvastatin and Paxlovid into my handy-dandy Lexicomp you know, drug interaction checker on my phone, it's going to say, no go, don't do it. Um, but if you actually look at the literature, um, and, and they, they do a good job of summarizing the literature that's out there, it seems that yes, it, while it raises levels of the ritonavir part, raises levels of statins, it doesn't seem to put them at increased risk of rhabdo or liver problems. So basically, the if you, if you actually look at the, the 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 research that's been done on this, and again, all this research is done with old studies with ritonavir and all these other drugs, and, and so they're not looking directly at Paxlovid, right? But there's studies again from the 2000s that look at ritonavir and all these other drug interactions because that's what it's based on. And so uh, what what the what the uh, actual recommendation is, it says you know you can use but use with caution. Basically, if you just stop the statin during the five days you're on Paxlovid and then restart, you're good to go. So most other drug interactions would say it's a no-go, don't do it. But if you actually read the, the, the literature using the, the, the Liverpool uh, website, you, will, you can actually read the literature and make the call for yourself. I mean, and again, a lot of this is going to be a risk-benefit sort of thing, right? The other big one that I get asked quite a bit about, and I think there's pretty good data on now, is uh, uh, the DOAC, so patients on apixaban or rivaroxaban, you know, for, for atrial fib or whatever. Um, again, if you, if you just punch, the, if you punch ritonavir and, and a picks a band into a, drug, a regular drug interaction checker, it's just going to say, no go, don't do it. But again, if you actually, this, if you punch all that into the University of Liverpool uh, a website, it'll say, yeah, don't do it, but, and then you'll give you, here's our literature with, with, with these medications. And again, you find that in fact, you actually can use uh, Paxlovid in patients who are receiving DOACs. They need to hold the DOAC during the, during the five days of treatment and then restart usually two to three days down after, after stopping. So that's, I think, why I really like the, the, the Liverpool website. I was hoping to get a Unfortunately, the, uh, the, because it's a Liverpool, as you might imagine, it's from England, um, and unfortunately, the, the the websites here are blocked from from outside the country. <clears throat> kind of a shame because I could I could show you we could actually do a couple of real time things. I was hoping to kind of do that, but again, you can go to yourself and take a look at this, and it really is the one stop shop for for COVID nineteen drug interactions that I use all the time. So. So, um, you know, the, 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 here's some stuff that, that they basically, you know, the, uh, uh, medications without any cl clinically relevant interactions. Again, most of these aren't ones that I particularly worry about in, in patients. So, I mean, none of these really are big cytochrome P450 drugs, so I'm not really worried about any of these medications. But again, a wide variety of medications are still relatively safe to use with ritonavir. Um, and so that's, that's Paxlovid. We're actually going to dive back into Paxlovid when we talk about COVID rebound and stuff like that in just a few minutes. This is the paper from New England Journal of Medicine looking at early remdesivir to prevent progression to severe uh, uh, COVID-19 in outpatients. And so uh, this study, they actually looked at, again, at, at patients at high risk, um, and, and those patients received three days of intravenous uh, uh, remdesivir uh, compared to placebo. 
This was all done in, in an infusion center. So patients actually went in the infusion center, got a peripheral IV, and had the, their remdesivir infused. And as you can see here, uh, there was a statistically significant decrease in progression to severe COVID-19, which they again counted as uh, develop, uh, need for oxygen, hospitalization, or death. And as you can see, there, there was statistically significant difference. Again, the overall numbers are relatively low. You know, I mean, they have to kind of blow this up on, on this part of the Kaplan myograph to show you the difference. But it was statistically significant. Number needed to treat was, was, was quite a bit higher with remdesivir than it was with, with Paxlovid. And you have the added irritation of having to get these guys into an infusion center, which is, as you might imagine, pretty challenging, especially when, you have, when you're overwhelmed with COVID patients. So we only really do this in patients who absolutely can't be on Paxlovid. Um, and so at our, in our infusion center, again, a year and a half ago, we, you couldn't get a chair in our infusion center to save your life because you know the, the chairs were continually full of patients getting, again, getting remdesivir. Now those numbers have dropped to almost nothing, but because we, we rarely recommend its use, basically. And then finally, uh, uh, molnupinavir, which is the third medication. It was actually the first uh, oral medication out on the market uh, for COVID-19, um, and, and uh, it did. This is uh, from the Move Out study, and it, you know, we did find a statistically significant uh, decrease in using uh, molnupinavir in patients who are, again, at high risk and non-hospitalized. This was looking at, at progression to, to um, uh, hospitalization. Um, it did reach statistical significance, but the numbers are by far lower than both Paxlovid and Remdesivir. And so it did reach statistical significance, but just barely. And the actual clinical implications of the outcomes were, were, were lower. And so a general rule of thumb is molipenavir seems to have a, a relative risk decrease of about 30% for, for progressing to severe uh, uh, COVID-19 disease, whereas Remdesivir is probably in the 50-60% range and Paxlovid is probably in the 60-70% to 70 range. So Paxlovid is probably our most effective agent at preventing progression to severe COVID in these patients. So so, and then uh, uh, the, the guidelines talk about uh, bevlativimab. Uh, this is a, uh, a monoclonal antibody that actually attacks the spike protein of, of uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2. Um, uh, this is, uh, 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 again, looking, this is a, on the left side, you've got a graph that kind of takes a look at placebo and then uh, uh, bevlativimab and then bevlativimab with several other monoclonal antibodies and basically found that, yes, there is, if you look, take a look here on study day three to seven, there is a decrease in, in progression. To, to severe disease. But as I said before, um, the FDA EUA basically says that it's only recommended in use when alternative COVID-19 therapy options are, uh, are, are approved. It shouldn't, it shouldn't be used or if they're not accessible. So basically they say that this is really only should be used when you can't access anything else. And again, more recent evidence in the last six weeks to, to, to three months basically suggests that all monoclonal antibodies are not effective against the latest substrains uh, and, and variants of Omicron. So we're probably not going to see much use of it anymore. So here's a nice summary uh, that you can kind of take a look at. So again, Paxlovid is, is kind of the big dog here. Uh, the dose is, is uh, as you kind of see, and it is adjusted based on their EGFR. Duration is five days. If they have time from symptomatic out of less than five days, because that's where it seemed the real benefit is. And again, we'll talk about, about we already talked about uh, drug interactions. Remdesivir, um, uh, you get uh, uh, 200 milligram load and then 100 milligrams daily on day two and three. If they have to have time of onset less than seven seven days. But again, the real pain with that is that it's an infusion over anywhere from half an hour to two hours. And you need to do infusions on three consecutive days, which is going to be challenging for many patients as well as, as, as the health system. We won't talk about bevlacivimab because again, it probably shouldn't be used anymore. And then molipenavir, 800 milligrams P, uh, POBID for again, for five days, but again, potentially less efficacious than, than, than other options. And there does seem to be some safety concerns. It seems for example, to be more liver problems with molipenavir than, than, than Paxlovid. So, um, uh, the, the other that, again, I'm just going to briefly talk about um, is uh, the, the other uh, monoclonal antibody that has been used for, for, for prevention um, of it is, is a, uh, an, again, I won't even call this, it's just Covishield is what everybody calls it. So Covishield is actually, uh, F, is, has an FDA EUA not for treatment of, of COVID, but for prevention. And so patients who, for example, are on immunosuppressive medications who would be at very high risk for progression, um, uh, these are the patients you'd want to consider for, for uh, intermediate muscular treatment with, with Covishield to prevent stuff. And here's, again, another... It seems like the New England Journal publishes all these studies. This was the Pro Provent study uh, where they took a look at, at patients, again, at high risk for developing severe COVID-19 disease. Uh, it was a small study, as you can see, they only had about 40 patients in it, but it was enough to get the EUA from the, from the FDA on it. And uh, you, see, you see a dramatic drop. In fact, the hazard ratio was 0.17. So you see a dramatic drop in uh, a, a progression to... or developing COVID-19 and progression to severe COVID-19. And, and 
and again, the overall numbers are fairly small, but it is statistically significant. So you, you know, in patients who are at high risk, in in, in our uh, health system at, at Methodist, we really try to push this uh, for patients who are kidney or are, are, are transplant patients on you know uh, calcineurin inhibitors or on um, um, uh, bicofenolate uh, patients who are on these drugs for other reasons, uh, cancer patients who are receiving immunosuppressive therapy, stuff like that. Um, our big cancer center is is uh, Mission Cancer in, in Des Moines. They, they're kind of the big, the, not really the only game in town as far as as far as oncology, and they've they've tried to really really do a good job of adapting this at high risk patients. And then we really only have one rheumatology group in town, and they've they've tried to do the same thing with a little bit less success. So again, uh, if you're a primary care physician and you're and you're dealing with patients with this, you know, if if you consider them high risk, you really should consider referring them uh, either to infectious diseases or to um, um, uh, whoever's running, you know, the, the use of this in, in your health system to get, to get them lined up. The data is pretty clear that we underuse Covishield, and so we probably should be using it more. So. So this is the, the emergency use authorization. It is not used, you're not supposed to use it as a substitute for the vaccine. Some people have asked, you know, can, can you know, can, you could, if I don't want, you know, for X, Y, Z reasons, I don't want to get the vaccine because it's, it's going to put a 5G chip in my head or whatever reason they're using now to not get the vaccine. Um, you know, can I use this in substitution? And that, the EUA is clear that you shouldn't be. And really it's, it's for PrEP, so pre-exposure prophylaxis in patients over age 12 and weighing over age uh, over 40 kilograms who do not have SARV co-infection and have not been recently exposed and then are moderate to severe immunocompromised um, or are not able to be fully vaccinated to a history of severe adverse reactions to COVID-19. What this, that, this talk really isn't supposed to talk about vaccines much, but it is worth noting that, uh, uh, you know, a lot of the, a lot of the, um, Supposed uh, inter, uh, uh, contraindications using vaccines is not what CDC recommends. So, for example, you know, I was kind of taught, you know, if someone has a history of Guillain-Barré syndrome, even if it even it had nothing to do with a vaccine, you probably shouldn't vaccinate them. And yeah, actually, if you go to the CDC website, they say no, nah, you should vaccinate them. That the that the benefit of getting the vaccine way outweighs the risk of of of, of, G, of GBS because it's so rare. So, and then basically uh, they get an intermuscular shot with this stuff, and then you can repeat it Q six months for ongoing risk. So. Um, uh, th- the, the, uh, the, they updated the, the um, COVID shield uh, uh, package insert in April 2022, and they basically just did a cha- they basically changed the dosing. The dosing kind of went up, and again, that was just a, to, to get good drug levels for a long period of time. So. All right, so um, that's kind of some background, and, and again, we're going to talk about Paxlovid a little bit more. Um, uh, again, there's a number of therapeutics authorized or approved for treatment of mild, moderate COVID-19, um, and, and we'll talk about that. And, and as you might guess, primary care physicians uh, do play a big role in, in identifying these patients and making sure they have access to, to the medication. This might be a problem in the future because up until uh, this point, Paxlovid has essentially been paid for by the federal government, and that actually is going to come to an end at the end of this year. That yeah, patients are going to have to do like they do with everything else. They're going to have to pay a copay for it in the whole nine yards. The rumor going around is that most insurance companies will be pretty, pretty lax, pretty, pretty easy to get the drug approved. You know, there'll be like a five dollar copay or ten dollar copay. But there may be some patients who don't have insurance who may actually have to pay full cash price for this, and they're saying it's probably going to be one hundred and fifty to two hundred bucks. So something to keep in mind. All right, so again, kind of a review of, of more you know, hospitalized patients. So this is inpatient treatment of COVID. Um, again, if, I, if you guys are like us, we haven't seen a lot of COVID being hospitalized, but when we do see these patients, they tend to do much better if they're vaccinated. Um, uh, I was talking to my intensivist just the other day because we actually had a patient in our ICU, uh, and we haven't had one in a while, who had, you know, who had uh, uh, you know, severe COVID and was on Aervo, and the, you know, he was vaccinated, and he turned around within two or three days of being on Aervo and we got him down to room air and got him out. And so that's, to me, in my world, that's the big difference between COVID in December 2022 and COVID in December 2021 was that, or 2020, was that uh, those patients, uh, almost all of them, if they got to Aervo, most of them got vented, most of them died. And we haven't seen a COVID death in quite a while. Um, I, I'd say at least seven or eight months we haven't had a COVID death. So um, I think the, that shows that the vaccines are very effective as are, as is Paxlovid for preventing progression. But we still occasionally get patients who admitted for primary COVID. Um, if, if they do not require oxygen, then we can use remdesivir as, as, as an inpatient. Um, uh, the big problem I always have with that is that, you know, they've usually had COVID for seven or eight days and then they come, you know, get sick enough to come into the hospital. And remember at that point that, you know, you, there's kind of an antiviral phase where, the, you know, you're going to get a benefit from, from antivirals. And then there's the inflammation phase where, where antiviral drugs probably have no 
effect. Uh, by the time they get to come to us, you know, it, it, uh, it seems that we're probably beyond the point at which antivirals are actually going to do something. But that's certainly what, what we what we give these patients, um, even at a fairly low evidence level of of of, of B three or B two A, basically. Um, and then for hospitalization that requires conventional oxygen, you do want to add on dexamethasone. Um, and and again, the piv the pivotal study that looked at dexamethasone find this they found that six milligrams IV or PO daily for ten days at, uh, improves outcomes in, in hospitalized patients. These are patients, again, who are, who are not on high flow or, or non-invasive ventilation. These are basically patients who are on nasal cannula. And then if they are having rapidly increasing oxygen needs, either PO baricitinib or IV tocalizumab, we have switched almost entirely, or we had switched almost entirely uh, baricitinib just because it's far easier to give. Um, and, and, and so we'll, we'll use that. The big thing to watch out for those patients is uh, uh, an increase in their LFTs, which we've seen a couple of times, as well well as a lymphopenia, which is the big side effect you have to watch out for. And if their absolute lymphocyte count drops below 150, you need to stop the, stop the, the baricitinib. And then if they require high flow nasal oxygen or non-invasive ventilation, again, dexamethasone plus either PO, baricitinib, or IV tocalizumab. Um, there are other places that have used a lot of, 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 of uh, sarlilumab, which is kind of the oral version of to tofacitinib. It's an IL-6 blocker, but we have never used that at, at Methodist. Um, and then finally, if they're on uh, uh, ECMO or mechanical ventilation, uh, basically the same stuff. Anecdotally, and I'll tell you, this is kind of off-label, we, uh, about a year and a half uh, into the, yeah, about a year into the pandemic, started using high-dose steroids in these patients. We started we started getting away from DEX-6, and we were starting to use, you know, 60 to 125 milligrams of methylprednisolone for, for three to five days and then back them off. The big problem in these patients is, of course, they go on to develop ARDS. And uh, we at least have some data suggesting that high dose steroids in the early phases of ARDS may improve outcomes. And so we, we kind of abandoned dexamethasone and patients who were vented, like I said, it's probably been a, it was probably about a year into the in, into the pandemic, and switched most of these patients to 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 high dose steroids. I'm not sure it really helped, but but um, I, I, the 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 biologic plausibility was certainly there uh, that these patients developed ARDS, and we would treat these people as if, as if they had ARDS from any other reason. Basically, the other thing I don't want to skip about talking about is anticoagulant therapy. As we all know, uh, COVID is absolutely associated with an increased risk of both venous and arterial clotting, and so you want to make sure that even in, in, in relatively healthy patients, they get a prophylactic dose of heparin. And then uh, actually in hospitalized patients who require conventional oxygen, the guidelines suggest a therapeutic dose of heparin in patients who don't have an increased bleeding risk. We tried that for a while, but we ended up with some pretty, we had, ended up with several bad outcomes because people were bleeding because we were giving them the IV heparin. So we kind of, we, at, at the beginning of the pandemic, we were basically putting everybody on heparin drips, then we kind of backed off on that. And so basically for other patients who don't have high risk, uh, basically heparin as well. Oops, sorry. And then uh, for, for all, all other patients, basically, prophylactic dose of heparin. There is some evidence to suggest that, that anoxaparin may be superior to heparin. Um, and so we would actually, if patients didn't have a contraindication to anoxaparin, their renal function was okay, et cetera, et cetera, we would actually switch them over to anoxaparin. So um, not to belabor testing. Um, I don't know about you guys, but uh, we had, well, my, my youngest daughter got really sick a couple weeks ago, high fevers and all that stuff. And I went to go get you know, our little stockpile of COVID tests and I realized they were all expired. You know, and I was like, oh, <laughs> yeah, I guess we haven't had to test anybody in a while. Um, and so, you know, I was like, well, you know, this is all I got. So we're going to try it anyway. And, and uh, you know, and if, if, the test, if the tests are anything like uh, uh, drugs, even as, you know, any pharmacist will tell you that, yeah, you know, uh, uh, most, but probably 95% of drugs that say they expire on, you know, 12 of 22, they're probably good for years afterwards. They put in basically an artificial exp expiration date on a lot of this stuff. So I was like, eh, you know, it's all I got. So we'll give it a shot and see what happens basically. So uh, we now, of course, have most everybody's on rapid antigen tests, which are fairly sensitive and fairly specific. Um, and then molecular tests such as PCR are even more so. Um, and um, to, to get uh, uh, some of these uh, 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 therapies, not Paxlovid necessarily, but certainly for the, for the uh, monoclonal antibodies or remdesivir, they actually usually will require a positive PCR in addition to, to home rapid testing for the antigen, basically. So. Um, I cannot emphasize enough that the CDC um, and the World Health Organization are the two comprehensive places for, the, for, for getting the latest information on treatment. And so, uh, you know, this is such a rapidly changing area that, you know, uh, everything I tell you right now could very well be invalidated in the next six months because that's just how rapidly things are changing. Um, so, again, don't 
take my word for it. If you have any questions or you're wondering what the latest information is on, on COVID, please go to the CDC website and take a look at it. They have a nice page on treatment. They have a nice page on the latest data for underlying conditions, which is what this link shows. They even have a real-time tracker of, of, of uh, county, state, and national trends as far as COVID infection and which uh, um, uh, subvariant you're looking at as well, though I think for most clinicians that probably does not really matter. You know. So again, Paxlovid, uh, it's important to remember that, that Paxlovid is not FDA approved. I mean, yeah, that means not, not don't use it, but I've had a, a number of people say, well, you know, you know, I've had a number of people tell patients, well, that, you know, this got FDA approved last year. It's like, no, actually it hasn't gotten the FDA approval yet. It's still under an emergency use authorization. Now that doesn't mean it doesn't work. We have solid data showing it's working. And I know that Pfizer has, has is, I, I think, almost to the point of actually submitting an actual NDA. I could see where Pfizer's probably in not any great hurry to do that. I'm sure they're making plenty of money right now from Paxlovid under its EUA, so why go through all the hassle of getting it FDA approved if you don't have to do that? So, um, uh, you know, I, I don't know when Paxlovid is actually going to get FDA approved, but I'm sure at some point it probably will. Um, and, and again, we, as we talked about, uh, the, the, the nermitri nermitralivir is basically a, a protease inhibitor that it kind of works kind of like uh, protease inhibitors work for HIV. It basically just blocks the ability of, of SARS-CoV-2 to replicate, but it needs ritonavir to, 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 to get that up to that level. You want to give it as soon as possible, uh, and certainly within five days, and we've talked about renal insufficiency as well. Um, uh, again, I won't belabor this. There are some other websites, but again, I, I really would recommend using the, the University of Liverpool website as, as you go. Remdesivir, uh, how it works, it's, it's a nucleotide analog, so basically it gets into the, into the viral RNA and, and basically keeps it from replicating as well, but unfortunately it has to be given by, by infusion. Um, uh, there were some uh, uh, reports of hypersensitivity reactions, so the, uh, the, the AUI suggests they need to monitor patients during infusion for at least one after hour infusion. I'm not going to lie. I don't think our infusion center really does that. I think we were so busy at one point. As long as they didn't develop an anaphylactic reaction during the, the infusion, they pretty much kicked them out and said, good luck, you know, sort of thing. We've talked about bet, bet live maps. So I won't really belabor it, but it, it works basically because it targets the spike protein, but it's probably no longer recommended. And then molapemivir works because it, it's a, another nucleoside analog that, that basically prevents replication as well. So timing should be, again, as, as soon as possible after the COVID-19 diagnosis and with five days of the symptom onset. Again, its big problems, as you see here, is, the, is probably the thing that, that, that really gets it in trouble is the uh, in, uh, uh, animal studies suggest that it is unfortunately uh, toxic to embryos. And so you would not want to use it in a woman of childbearing age if she could become pregnant. Uh, and then also uh, there is, it's like, uh, like uh, the tetracyclines in patients under age 18. It may affect bone and cartilage growth, so it's not, a, uh, not approved in, in, in uh uh, patients who are not adults. And so they actually basically say, and this is in the EUA, that if you're going to use uh, 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 this drug in females of, uh, uh, who are, or could become pregnant, they need to uh, uh, be on contraception for the duration of treatment and for four days after the last dose. And the same with males, because apparently the, 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 the fetal damage can even occur in, in transfer of, 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 of sperm to the, to, to, the, to the egg. And so again, the same thing with men during treatment and for three months after the, three months after the last dose. So again, that's just going to make this drug you know, very difficult to implement in, in that. I sometimes, uh, we, and something we, something we struggled at, uh, at, at Methodist was, you know, how do you, how do you prioritize resource scarcity? And again, this isn't as big a deal today as it was a year ago or, or, or a year and a half ago. Um, you know, but, but there was some real fear, especially when we were, you know, basically just completely overwhelmed with COVID patients that we would not have to, to, that we would not have the ability to treat all patients equally. Um, and so there was, there was, you know, uh, when, when Paxlovid first came out, you just couldn't get it. I remember the one or two hot, one or two pharmacies in, in, in Des Moines who had it. I mean, I, they, they say, you know, there was lines out the door to get it like, like the day after they got it because it was like, oh my gosh, you know, here's this, this oral medication and it works really good and all this other stuff. So, I mean, at that point, uh, in the unity point system, we tried to, to, to tier patients and said, oh, you know, all right, who can, who should really get Covishield? Who should really get, you know, Paxlovid? And it's, it's pretty much all the stuff we've talked about here. You know, again, immunocompromised patients should really be at the top of the tier because the evidence is clear that they're that they're at highest risk for progression to, to severe disease, and that's regardless of vaccine status, and that's what we adopted as well. And then unvaccinated individuals also at high risk of severe disease. So anyone over age 75 or with additional risk factors over age 65, you could debate, you know, the 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 the, the, um, the ethicalness of, of doing that, but that's not what I'm here for. Basically, tier two uh, unvaccinated individuals who are not included in tier one who are at risk of severe disease. So again, once 
once you kind of strike out all the immunocompromised patients, anyone else who, who uh, is, is at risk of severe disease. Tier three, we're vaccinated individuals at high risk of severe disease because, again, we know <clears throat> the vaccine, even now, very, very uh, well prevents severe disease. No, it does not prevent people from getting COVID. But <coughs> excuse me. <clears throat> But just like the pneumococcal, and this is this is sometimes if you ever get into into arguments with with big anti-vax people, like, well, it doesn't even prevent the the infection. Yeah, it probably doesn't, but it prevents uh, significantly the, the development of, of progression to severe disease, just like the pneumococcal vaccine does. I mean, we've been recommending pneumococcal vaccines to patients for fifty years. There was never any evidence that showed that you were less likely to get pneumonia if you received the pneumococcal vaccine. What it showed conclusively was that it not only decreased hospitalizations, but decreased death in patients due to pneumonia. So, you know, yes, it didn't probably people get people from getting pneumonia, but you were much less likely to get hospitalized and die from it. And we recommended that for with no real resistance for years and years, right? So I think that's kind of the kind of the same thing that, that you're looking at, basically. So the other thing that's really kind of been beaten to the ground by the by the uh, the lay media is is, is COVID-19 rebound. Uh, there have been case reports that, that suggest that, that patients who have a normal immune response who complete a five-day course uh, will actually get symptoms back two to eight days after completing the five-day course. And actually, if, if, you, if they tested negative uh, at the end of, their, of, of the PAX of the treatment, they may actually test positive again uh, af after that. Um, there's been some theories about why this might be. The, the one that seems to make the most sense to me is that we're probably not treating long enough, that five days probably isn't enough or long enough a treatment, but that's probably not going to change because FDA is not likely to change the EUA on Paxlovid until we have more data showing that a longer therapy course is better than a shorter therapy course. Interestingly, it does not seem that COVID-19 rebound increases the risk of, of uh, progression to severe disease or it increases the risk of, of long COVID, which we're going to talk a little bit about here in just a second. So um, they did kind of do a retrospective study in, in the Epic HR study. Um, they wanted to take a look at, at, the, at the risk of developing so-called COVID rebound in these patients. And again, this was a study that, that, that looked uh, um, at patients who had, had gotten Paxlovid. So basically a small number of participants had one or more positive SARS-CoV-2 testing after testing negative or an increase in the amount of SARS-CoV-2 detected by PCR after completing their treatment course. And this was all done by, by nasal sam swab samples. <clears throat> This finding was observed in patients randomized to Paxlovid and in patients who were randomized to placebo. And that's the other thing that they're, that they're saying is that it's, it's going to be difficult to determine the actual incidence of COVID rebound because if you take a look at the studies, there, it wasn't just people who got Paxlovid whose symptoms waxed and waned. People who didn't get Paxlovid symptoms also waxed and waned. So it's, you know, it's going to be hard to really tell what, you know, is this really a clinical phenomenon? And if so, you know, it does, what's the, what's the incidence of, of being on it if you get Paxlovid? So um, how do you treat it? You don't. There's no current evidence suggesting that that additional treatment I've, I've been asked that question should i give another course of, pa of paxlovid no there's no evidence suggesting that's going to improve anything um, um and it doesn't change the conclusions that paxlovid again has a marked reduction in hospitalization and death uh, there are a number of studies ongoing right now to determine why this is and to determine if we can figure out if there are risk factors is it the immunosuppressed patient who may you you know their own re own immune system can't mount a good defense against uh, sars cov2 so they basically need longer treatment and that stuff's kind of all going Going on now as we go along. Uh, there is a, a test to treat locator, though again, this doesn't tend to be as bi uh, big a problem, but, but there's that 1-800 number that you can call to, and, and to, to get a, 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 a place that will not only test you, but will have the ability to give you treatment right on site. And there's a number of these, of these uh, uh, centers throughout the, throughout the United States. Again, we don't use a lot of this at Methodist because I think we're pretty good at, at, and I think in Des Moines and probably in Ames, we have fairly good access to Paxlovid. So it's not one of those things where only two pharmacies carry it in the whole of Des Moines, almost every pharmacy carries it. So it, there, yeah, this is really, I think, used much more for patients who, uh, um, uh, or places where there may only be one pharmacy in the county or one pharmacy in this geographic area that happens to have it, rather than going to their local you know, physician or, or, or provider, getting the positive test and driving 50 miles to go get it. It's like, just go to the, 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 the clinic or now in some cases the pharmacy, you get tested and then, and then uh, you meet all the, meet all the criteria for, for getting Paxlovid, you're going to get it basically. So, 
The other thing that, that is uh, under intense scrutiny and studies right now is equity. Uh, the evidence is actually pretty clear that, that uh, uh, patients in low, lower socioeconomic strata and patients of color are much less likely to get Paxlovid or other therapies compared to, to other cohorts. And so uh, there's, there's a, lot of, um, um, uh, ev a lot of research going on saying why is this and how can we fix it? Um, and again, that's probably ab above my pay grade to try and answer that question. But I think there's really been a, a, a at the state level, I think there's really been uh, an improvement to try and say how do how do we seek out patients who, who might be in lower socioeconomic strata and and make sure they have access to testing because again tests aren't aren't, aren't aren't expensive I don't think I mean I was you know nowadays you're able to get two or three tests for twenty bucks but for people in in again lower socioeconomic strata they may not have that twenty bucks and so they just go oh well I guess I've got po you know COVID I, I don't I don't know what to do about it and I don't know if I can get treatment for it because I'm homeless and I can't you know I can't go to a doctor or something like that so I, I think there's there, there's been uh, some state level uh, 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 initiatives to improve equity uh, uh, to to uh, treatment and uh, testing and treatment, basically. Um, uh, this is uh, if you want more of a a a, uh, a, a, a paper um, uh, a guideline for the treatment of of uh, uh, COVID. Uh, the uh, um, uh, uh, U.S. Department of Health and Human Services has the uh, Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Response, and they have uh, uh, the clinical implementation guide. So, if you wanted, for example, to do a better job of getting Paxlovid in your clinic to start, or getting a, a better testing workflow, or maybe even if you're in a in in a, in a clinic where you see a lot of immunocompromised patients, you'd like to start uh, uh, COVID Shield on them and how do you get access to COVID Shield? I mean, the beauty of COVID Shield is since it's given by IM injection, you don't need an infusion center. I mean, basically, if your clinic gives you know penicillin shots or, or, or receptin shots, then you can probably give this as well. So, you know, how are you going to implement those? How are you going to get them set up in a clinic? Uh, uh, this is a, a pretty good website to take a look at to help with that as well. Um, I, I won't I won't belabor this. This is just kind of a, a an algorithmic approach to to uh, uh, what we've talked about before as far as treatment. So um, you know if you're if you're a person who likes to look at at um, algorithms more than just charts, I, I kind of like this. And again, this is this is. Uh, um, uh, from this ASPR website, and I'm not going to belabor because it's 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 basically the the very similar guidelines to the CDC guidelines. Uh, but again, you know, packs of it is is really our 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 most important weapon in the in the treatment. And within five days of symptom onset, as long as they don't have severe renal insufficiency, and then if that doesn't work, if you're in a place where you can get remdesivir, that's what you should be done. And then uh, again, they say that you know again, molipinavir is really if if pregnancy can be ruled out, and it should be started within within five days of symptom onset and then for pediatric patients and and uh, you know we uh, right now we're overwhelmed with RSV <laughs> that's what we're getting destroyed with is RSV but but we have had some bad COVID patients uh, who were pediatric patients many of these patients uh, were immuno immunocompetent so they're not you know they're not the cystic fibrosis patient or the patient with congenital heart disease that you would think would be high risk of progressing to COVID yes we saw some of those too but we had some fairly healthy kids um, who developed pretty severe COVID our mortality rate I think was zero I don't think I saw anybody die from it, thank goodness, but you certainly want to avoid uh, hospitalizations. So again, if you have a patient over age 28 years, uh, you still can consider remdesivir in those patients. Um, and uh, we unfortunately don't have a lot of data on any of the other treatments. So that's probably what you would have to do is, is basically consider remdesivir in those patients. Um, you know, influenza and, and, and uh, uh, um, COVID, you know, again, the so-called tri uh, triple-demic that we're, that we're dealing with. I have not yet seen a patient who's been both positive for COVID and uh, for um, uh, uh, the flu, but it definitely has been reported. And so one of the very common questions I get asked is, you know, uh, you know, if I've got someone who where, you know, they, I, I might only have captured them for, for, for one day, can I go ahead and, and, and give them both the influenza shot and the COVID vaccine? And the answer is absolutely you can, you know, so you can get both of those and there doesn't seem to be any problem associated with that. So that's really it. I think, you know, uh, uh, you know, what I basically say is, you know, think we're in a lot better better place today, or at least, you know, we are at Methodist a lot better place today than we were 18 months ago. I mean, even to the point where when we've gotten patients who've, who've got, who've gotten severe COVID enough to be in the ICU, you know, my attendings and I have to kind of put our heads together and go, okay, now how do we treat these patients? You know, whereas again, as recently as 18 months ago, you know, it was, it was, you know, it was just burned in our brains because we'd done so much of it. So we're in a much, much better place, I think, than we were uh, 18 months ago. Um, no one knows what the future holds. Uh, one hopes that, that, 
the trend of of, of less virulent uh, variants is going to continue. But I think that that we're not really in a place where we can say goodbye to COVID anytime soon, unfortunately. So thank you for having me. Um, any questions, this is my web, uh, my email address. And if you're a podcast person, I do have a weekly podcast um, called the Game Changers Clinical Conversations Podcast. You can get it if you just put CE Impact in, in your, in your uh, podcast searcher. And we have about 1,500 downloads a week. So we're actually, uh, we're actually getting, I think, kind of popular. So questions? Yes, sir. Uh, thanks for a great lecture. I um, had a question about Evisheld. Mm -hmm. um, is the uh, benefit uh, as good for the newer variants of COVID or? It's a great question. So the question is, is, is Evishield uh, as good against the different um, um, uh, uh, variants of Omicron variants? The data to date suggests, yes, it is. So unlike the, the treatment monoclonal antibodies, where I think the, uh, the, um, the shape of the, of, the, of the virus has changed just enough for that it, the monoclonal antibody has not have anything to bind to. The combination that's used in Evi Shield, and they actually just had a, a big announcement on this, I think a month ago at the American Thoracic Society meeting, and their, their latest information suggests, yes, it works good. So, and, and I should mention, and I didn't have time to mention this in this talk, because again, showing how quickly you need to update this information. Uh, just a week ago in, uh, in uh, um, the um, uh, uh, journal Clinical Infectious Diseases, that again, just came out like two weeks ago, there was a study looking at zinc, 50 milligrams BID, as a, as a, a preventative, not a treatment for COVID-19, and I actually found it worked. And so again, I'm, you know, again, I'm not, I haven't read the study yet. I've read the, read the abstract. I'll be looking forward to, to reading the study, uh, but if so, that might, uh, you know, I mean, you know, after so many false starts with, with drugs like hydroxychloroquine and all this other junk, you know, this was a well done study in a reputable, reputable journal. And, and if you, re I actually read the, the, uh, the editorial before I read the paper and the editorial basically said, yeah, this is a good study. I don't know what to tell you, <laughs> you know, so, you know, so we'll see if, if that actually makes, makes it onto the guidelines as well. So another question about Evisheld. How long would you recommend continuing to repeat the dose? That's a good question. So the question is, how long do you recommend continuing Evisheld? Basically, as long as they're at risk. So if you had a patient, for example, who had cancer, who was going to get you know six months of intensive chemotherapy, but then after that not get any more chemotherapy, you probably wouldn't need to continue it. But if it was a renal transplant patient um, and who is going to be on you know immunosuppressive drugs for a, quite a while, they're probably going to get a Q six months. I don't know, is there a way to see if online there's anybody questions or? Let's see. I guess not. <laughs> Other questions? If there are any, I can email you. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you very much for your time, everyone.